This workshop is part of the Zero to Mastery Academy. You can watch the full workshop and all previously held workshops by joining the Zero to Mastery Academy. Click the link in the video description below to check it out. Hello, my name is Matt Studder and welcome to my workshop. Today we're going to be looking at how to work with a design file as a developer. So this is actually a key part of being especially a front-end developer where you will take in a design file from a designer. You might have a few other little bits and pieces in there as well. We're going to be looking at things like design systems and other tools that you might be using depending on the company that you're working in. Um, but you will typically be taking in a design file. You'll then have to plan it out, break it down and then implement it in code. And so your role as a developer is very much to kind of build these little parts of the website and the entire website, uh, all of these little components together, build them in the most maintainable kind of best practice way possible using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, pulling them all together and then building a really nice looking website. So who am I? I am the founder of a company called Frontend Mentor. Uh, Frontend Mentor is a platform where we help people learn front-end development, but by building projects. So as opposed to giving uh, tutorials, like how-to tutorials, we presume, we assume that people already have that knowledge from somewhere else, like Zero to Mastery, for instance. And instead, we provide professional designs so that people can actually get practice, kind of hands-on experience building projects. Uh, and so just as a little example, here are a few of our latest challenges. Uh, we've got a mixture of free challenges where you can just dive in, start out straight away building projects. We can build little components, uh, different size websites, this kind of thing. And then we've also got some premium challenges, which are part of our pro subscriptions. These are very much um, fully fleshed out websites. These are um, complete applications as well, whereby if you build them, they will be absolutely incredible portfolio pieces, help you get jobs, um, give, give you a real insight into how to build websites in a professional way, in a professional environment. Um, and so this is what we offer. And today, during this workshop, we're actually going to be working through one of the front end mentor free challenges. We're going to be using a Figma design file along with um, the, the project. And we're going to use that Figma design file to actually implement the project in code. Okay, so let's actually look at this design file. So we're going to be using Figma today. Uh, Figma is one of the most popular design tools that are being used right now in lots and lots of companies. We're going to be looking at some different types of tools that you might expect to receive or use as a developer. We're going to be using Figma for this uh, project today. And in this Figma design file, we have got a desktop design. So we're looking at the desktop layout here. We've got kind of two columns up top uh, here, and then we've got three testimonials at the bottom, kind of three column layout. In this design file, we've also got a mobile layout as well. So in this mobile layout, you can see kind of everything, text is centered, uh, centrally aligned. We've got everything stacked on top of one another, just a fairly typical mobile layout. And this is the type of thing that you would expect to get from a designer. You would definitely expect to get um, mobile and desktop. You will also see, so I'm going to show you a project in a second, that you might also get the tablet and you'd hope to get the tablet layout as well. Um, so let's have a look at what you might expect. Like beyond this project that we're going to be building today, let's just have a little look at what you might expect to receive from a designer as a developer kind of working on a project. And first of all, it kind of, it depends, like it depends, like I hate using that term, but it does depend. It depends on the company. It depends on the processes. Different companies will have different tools. Um, larger companies might have more well entrenched kind of processes and a much more comprehensive system for you to work within. Whereas newer companies, startups, they might not have 
so many processes um, predefined. So you might have to kind of, uh, you, you might even have to build these processes yourself. You might have to create this stuff yourself. Um, so as an example of a typical design that you might receive on a more kind of fully fleshed out website. So for this design that we've got here, it's just a single section. It's just a single component um, within what you would consider probably to be a larger website. So this would typically be just one section maybe on the, on the homepage, for instance. Whereas I'll just show you one of the premium challenges, for instance, on Frontend Mentor, which is a multi-page website. So if I just zoom out and show you like all of the different things here, I don't expect you to obviously actually be able to read any of this at the moment. We're quite zoomed out as it is, but you can see we've got kind of desktop layouts here. Um, we've got different pages for the desktop um, layouts. We've got then also, if I go down here and zoom in a little bit, you can see that we've got the tablet layout. So you would actually be able to see how it should look at a specific size on a tablet. And then you kind of fill in the gaps in, in between those screen sizes. And you'll also see that we've then got the mobile layout as well. And within this, so we've got desktop, tablet, and mobile. You'll also see that with the desktop, we've got two versions of each page. And here, you can see, so this is just the, the natural desktop page, whereas the second version, you can see it's got the hover state. So we've got these little icons here um, with the little pointer where we're showing these different elements in their hovered states and in their active states. So for instance, you can see here on this element, we've got, it's moved up a little bit, it's also got a gradient along the border, and this would be it in its hovered state. So this is very, very typical. And also included in this file, in this challenge, and this is what we do in all of our kind of premium challenges as well to really try and mimic the real world process as much as possible. We include a very basic design system. And it's more of like a style guide. A design system is much more um, comprehensive and it might include things like spacings and different um, shades and tints of colors and all of this kind of thing. But this is a very basic design system. Um, like I said, you might call this more of a, a style guide, but it gives you things like colors. So the main accent colors, the, um, the different shades, the more neutral colors, um, these kinds of things. You'll also have the typography. So for instance, in this project, we have a font called DM Sans that we would be using. And within that, you can see that the different headings we've got for the large headings, for instance, we've got, it's kind of 40 pixels in size, 48 pixels for the line height and you can see the character spacings and all of this kind of thing so you can see it's 4.17 kind of very specific um spacing between the different letters that's the kind of horizontal letter spacing and so here we've also then towards the bottom we've got the buttons and so with these buttons we have um, the common buttons kind of in their hovered state and in their kind of normal state. And we've also got kind of what the buttons would look like on a dark background um, versus a light background. And this is very common for a design system. You would expect to get kind of all of the common reusable elements. You would get to see them in their different states. So light versus dark backgrounds, hovered normal kind of active states as well, like focused states, um, like all of these kinds of styles, you would expect to see these. So if you were to receive this as a developer in a professional environment, this is more along the lines of what you would be hopefully getting in a professional environment, desktop, desktop design, uh, tablet design, mobile design, a bit of a style guide or design system that you can work to. If it is an actual design system, like a fully fleshed out, very comprehensive design system, 
it might look a little bit more like this. And so this here is the material design um, kind of this is a like community design system that you can actually download um, online. And I'll leave the we'll leave the link in the in the resources for this as well. And you can download this online and it shows you what the actual design system would be. So if I go here and if we look at this, I'm going to zoom this in. I'll actually get rid of the sidebars as well. And we can see here, so this page is just the baseline components. So these are kind of common components, things like the navigation lists, um, things like here, for instance, we've got some a little data component, a little, a little graph. We've got the tabs, we've got the active states on them and this kind of thing. And then We've also got things like the typography. So this is very similar to the photo snap kind of multi-page website challenge that I was showing you just a second ago. And you can see here that we've got all of the common headline sizes. Like here, it might not even be that these are H1, H2, H3, H4. Like it doesn't necessarily dictate what element you're going to need to use in the, in the project but you would have at least this sort of hierarchy. And then you would decide, like as the developer, you would actually decide kind of what the level of heading should be. And so we've got some typography here. And then we've got things like colors as well. So again, similar to the photo snap design. Um, but in this instance, we've got a primary color. And then we've got the different shades and tints of the color. And we're in this design system, and this is quite a common approach as well. It's using this kind of increments of 100. So similar to like font weight, for example, whereby 900 is the darkest version of that color. And then 100 is the lightest version of that color. And here you can see that actually they've got kind of all the way down to 50. So they've actually added an extra little step in there so that it's an even lighter color. And then we've got things like elevation, so shadows and this kind of thing. And so depending on the company that you're working in, you might expect to also have a more fully fleshed out design system like this, where you've got all of the different shades for different colors, you've got all of the uh, possible font sizes that you might have in your project already declared. And this kind of thing is very, very common, especially in more established companies. Uh, a lot of the time, startup companies, small teams, they, depending on the designer, quite commonly, um, they may or may not have this. So this is the type of thing that you don't necessarily expect to receive as a developer, but it's very nice if you do have it, because that means that you've got these common constraints to work to, to help in your own workflow. And as I mentioned, we are going to be using Figma today. Figma is actually only one design tool though. There are, there are plenty of design tools out there. Another one that is a very common design tool that people use quite often is Sketch. Um, they, they do kind of similar things. Obviously, uh, they have different features and everything, but they are both very common design tools to be used in web development. There's also Adobe XD, which is another design tool that is quite commonly used as well. Uh, and so you would expect probably the likelihood is as a developer that you'd be working with one of these three tools. So either Figma, Sketch, or Adobe XD. And as I mentioned, we're gonna be using Figma today. Figma has just taken off. As far as the po popularity of it goes, it's just kind of absolutely exploded. Lots and lots of companies using Figma these days. Um, it's great because it works in the browser as well as the fact that they've got a standalone app for both Mac and Windows as well. Sketch, unfortunately, it only has a Mac app. They've got Sketch Cloud now, but um, and that, help, that definitely helps, but they don't actually have a standalone Windows app. 
Um, although now they do have this, this web app that they're using now as well. So Sketch, Figma, uh, Adobe XD, these are three design tools that you might expect to work with. Um, quite commonly these days, it's gonna be Figma that you'll be working with. Now let's have a look at some of the tools that you might use as a developer um, when you're actually building projects, but then also when you're working with designs as well. So rather than just working specifically in Figma, um, you might be using another design tool that actually helps with the handover process, like the, the handoff from the designer to the developer. It helps with the developer maybe um, exporting assets if the developer is supposed to be the person exporting the assets. And this will depend company to company. Sometimes it's the designer. Sometimes it's the developer. Um, sometimes you'll sit down and do it together. Uh, it's, it kind of depends on the company that you're working in. Let's now have a look at some of these tools that you might expect to use as a web developer. So one of them is Storybook and Storybook has really seen a, a big kind of uptake in, um, in usage in, in front end web development because it's a very, very nice tool that allows you to create a library of components essentially. And for those different components, you can have different states. You can um, literally have them as living, breathing sort of components. You change them in the library, they change on the website um, and they, allow for building this really maintainable uh, set of components that you then essentially piece together as far as your UI goes. It helps maintainability, uh, consistency in your design as well and in your actual UI when you're implementing it. So Storybook, definitely worth looking into if you haven't looked into it already. Another tool that you might come across as a developer is Zeppelin. So Zeppelin helps with the design to development handover process. And essentially it allows you to um, kind of create like design system with like just from the design things like color palettes and fonts and all that kind of stuff. You can kind of generate this uh, design system. You can also do things like collaborating on projects with your team, so commenting on different things. Um, you get little code snippets that you can pull out. Uh, with these design tools, like design to code tools though, like Zeppelin um, and the other one that we're gonna be looking at, which is Avocode as well. Both of these tools help improve the designer developer handover process. But as part of this, they offer this kind of code export. And this is one of these things that like it can be handy to, to look at this code, but typically as a developer, you're going to be changing this code around and improving it to make it more sort of best practice as far as the code actually goes. So like with this generated code, you get lots of like magic numbers, things like 47 pixels or 102 pixels or something like this. These are numbers where if you're writing them, if you find yourself writing them in your CSS, you're typically, that's a good sign that you're doing something wrong or there's a better way that you could do it. Also, the fact that they use things like pixels, for instance, pixels are a unit that we don't typically use uh, commonly these days with kind of responsive web design and this kind of thing. So actually you end up kind of changing the code around quite a bit based on these code exports. So although they're handy, I wouldn't rely on them too much. Uh, typically the code that they that they generate is code that you're gonna have to redo a little bit yourself anyway. And all of these tools, they, they help you work with designs and they also help you build kind of maintainable systems for when you're implementing your UIs. It's important to remember though, that Whenever you're actually implementing a design, this is a very common question that I get, especially on Front End Mentor, where you're building a project to a design. Uh, a very common question is, does it need to be pixel perfect? Like, am I building this thing to be pixel perfect? And the answer is like, you definitely don't need to chase this kind of pixel perfect uh, dream. And actually, Josh Komu, uh, a developer who's got a great blog, writes some great articles. 
uh, wrote an article called Chasing the Pixel Perfect Dream. And in this, he talks about very much similar to the kind of stuff that I will tell people as well, which is essentially as a developer, the designs are there for a guide. Like that's a visual guide of how it should look. You've got your mobile, tablet, desktop. You then need to figure things out as a developer and with your knowledge, build systems and build maintainable components and maintainable UIs using best practices and your best judgment as well. Also, within this environment, like a, a web browser, we've got these different browsers that all have their own different nuances and slightly different ways of rendering pages and rendering elements. So you can never absolutely guarantee kind of pixel perfect uh, UIs in across the different browsers as well. So this is definitely an article that I'd recommend reading. When you're building to a design, definitely don't necessarily think that you need to get it absolutely pixel perfect. You're trying to build the project using code that is maintainable, uh, using best practices for modern day web development. And you're trying to get sort of close to the design but you don't necessarily have to then go and really refine it to get absolutely pixel perfect. Like getting close enough, kind of 90, 95% of the way there is typically good enough. Again, this these numbers will change based on like project to project or design to design. Sometimes you might be able to get pixel perfect and that's great, but you don't necessarily need to hold it in your head as the goal whenever you're building a project. You don't need to get pixel perfect. You're focusing on, you should be focusing on the quality of the design or and the quality of the code that you're actually writing and how maintainable it's gonna be for you to carry on with, but then also for someone else to pick up with as well. Let's have a look at this design file now and actually start to plan out our project a little bit. Like what elements are we gonna use? What kind of layout are we gonna be expecting? All of this kind of stuff, it's well worth putting in the extra time like before you actually put your kind of fingers to the keyboard and actually start writing code. And you just take a step back, look at the design, plan things out, and then have this model in your head of what you're going to do before you actually do it, okay? So first of all, let's plan out the different regions for our code base. So we can see up here at the top, we've got this kind of content region where we've got the, the heading, like this heading here, we've got a paragraph. Um, we've got these reviews. This is what we're going to class, like this top region here is what we're going to class as um, a, a group. We're gonna have it as like a, a div, just a, a generic grouping of content. And then down here, we're going to have another group of the testimonials as well. So these are our two regions and we could choose here to go with either like Flexbox for the layout or we could choose to go with Grid for the layout. And again, this is one of the kind of decisions that you want to try and make wherever you can, try and make it ahead of time. So you're not just kind of head down coding, you're actually thinking things through and having a real rationale for why you might want to choose one or the other approach. In this instance, we could definitely use grid if we wanted to. We could have like, for instance, this content area could be its own um, kind of region on the page, like its own column. And we could then have the reviews here being their own one as well. And then we could maybe have these testimonials being sort of grouped together like this. However, what we're gonna do is we are just very much gonna keep it. So, and this is based on the design, it just, this is gonna be an easier approach to take, um, a little bit simpler as far as kind of how we're gonna do it. We're gonna have a flex container here displayed in a row. So we're gonna have one grouping of content here and then for the reviews, then we are gonna have another grouping down here at the bottom with the testimonials. So we're gonna go with a flex box approach. You could definitely go with either, but we are gonna go with flex box for this. So next up, let's have a little look at the actual hierarchy and let's talk about the semantics and the elements that we're gonna be using. So this 
as a design, this would be like, imagine this was a real web page. This would be a section within a web page. So first of all, this entire thing is going to be inside of a section element. The section element is going to be inside of a main element and the main and the section elements. These are what we know as HTML5 kind of structural elements. These are essentially more meaningful divs. Like they've got actual meaning to them. They help improve accessibility of a page because they mark out the different regions of your, of your page. So you should typically, you should be using things like main and section and other HTML5 elements like article, nav and header and footer and these kinds of things. So we're gonna have a main wrapping everything. We're then gonna have a section inside of the main and then we're gonna have a div at the top here, grouping this kind of top row together. And then we're gonna have a div at the bottom, grouping this bottom row. And then for the actual elements within those divs, we will have, so first of all, this piece of content up here, this is what we would consider our sort of H1. If this was again, like a larger website with multiple sections, this would probably be a H2 um, because you probably have your H1 element somewhere else in the, in the project. But because this is a project and a kind of website in its own right, like its own confined project, we're going to have this as our H1 because this is the main heading within this project. So this is going to be our H1. If we keep within like looking at headings for the moment, so this is definitely not a heading. This would be a paragraph of text here. These aren't, I wouldn't consider these to be headings. Like they are, they're not headings for other pieces of content. They're just pieces of content in their own right. Um, I also wouldn't necessarily class them as paragraph. A paragraph you typically have as a kind of larger block of text. So in this instance for content, we have a generic content element called a span and a span would be a perfect use in this instance because it's not a heading. It's not necessarily a paragraph as well. So we do need to wrap it in something. We do need to create kind of an element in the browser there. So we're going to use a span. Then if we move down to one of these testimonials, we've got the name of the person giving the testimonial. We're saying that they are a verified buyer for whatever this product is. And then we've got the text, which is their actual testimonial. So as far as headings go in the hierarchy of the content, while we're sticking to like the hierarchy of the content at the moment in our plan, we're going to go with the name of the person. So Colton Smith, for instance, this is going to be a H2 because this is definitely what I would consider to be a heading for this piece of content here. The person's name, it is very much like what they've said. They're a verified buyer. They have said kind of this paragraph of text and this is their testimonial. So we're going to use H2. This is going to be the same for all of the testimonials. And then this again, Verified buyer. This isn't really a heading for anything. Uh, it's just saying that they're a verified buyer. This would be another perfect use case for a span element. And then at the bottom here, we have got a paragraph of text. So as far as our actual content goes, we've got our plan. We've got the different hierarchy of content that we're going to be using. We've got our H1. We've got a paragraph. We've got some spans for the reviews. We've got H2s for the people's names. And then we've got spans for the verified buyer text. And then we've also got paragraphs for the actual content. Now, finally, let's have a little look at what we would think for these actual elements. Like for instance, these reviews and also these testimonials. So with these, I would consider this to be a list of reviews. 
So in this instance, this is a list of reviews. We've got the first list item, second list item, third list item. And so we're actually going to be using a unordered list for, for this. And these are going to be three individual list items. We're also going to do the same for the testimonials. This is definitely like a list of testimonials. And so we're going to be using an unordered list. Again, it's not necessarily kind of Colton Smith said this first, then Irene Roberts said this second. It's very much just an unordered list of comments. And so we're going to use a UL here. Each one of these is going to be a list item, and then we're going to have the content inside of them. Another element that you definitely could use in this instance would just be to use divs for these items. Divs are just a generic kind of element, like a generic structural element. They carry no semantic meaning whatsoever. And so this could be a perfect use case for a div as well. I like the extra semantics of having a list of reviews here because it's, this is definitely what I would consider to be a list of reviews. And then we've got a list of testimonials as well. So this is our kind of general structure for the the project and for the actual content hierarchy, um, all of this kind of stuff. We're going to be building in a mobile first workflow. And this means that we're actually going to build the mobile layout first. So we need to double check that there's not going to be too much kind of shifting around that needs to happen before we actually begin the coding. And we can see here that actually this kind of grouping of sort of introductory content with the heading and the paragraph. This is just what we've got over here on the left hand side. And then this stacks on top of the reviews, which then in turn stack on top of the testimonials. So here we're going to be able to keep kind of the HTML structure very much like as as we expect it to be based on the the desktop design and so i don't kind of foresee any shifting and reordering or anything like this of content and this is definitely something that you need to think of ahead of time and think like okay am i going to need to reorder these a little bit at some point maybe using grid or flexbox or something where you can change the order um, you need to just think ahead and plan things out so we're going to go with mobile first. As I mentioned, mobile first is actually a great workflow to use. So mobile first workflow, you're literally building the mobile version of the project first, building out the HTML, building out the styles, and then you're building, um, you're adding kind of media queries and changing the layout based on the screen size getting larger. And this is as opposed to working desktop first, where we might use this layout first and then build everything for this layout and then add media queries to change the content as we move down. And the reason why many developers prefer to use a mobile first workflow is actually because it gets a little bit easier to kind of expand your layout and to start adding more complexity to your layout rather than starting with the most complex layout possible and then like reducing the actual uh, screen size and then removing elements and kind of reordering things and everything like this. It can get a little bit more funky if you're working from desktop down to mobile as opposed to with mobile up to desktop. You're kind of gradually adding more complexity to the layout. And with these, you're also typically using what we call min width media queries as well. So if I had a media query of min width 700 pixels, for instance, as an example, then any person that comes to our website using a mobile phone, anything below 700 pixels, they actually won't load in the styles in that min width media query. So actually it saves a little bit of bandwidth, especially if you were gonna be loading in some background images or something like this in the larger media query, it will actually save some bandwidth. So um, this is a really, really good approach to take. And this is the approach that we're going to be working with during this workshop. Okay, let's actually dive into the project now. And first of all, just have a little look around, see what files we've got to work with at the beginning uh, and how we're gonna get this project started. So first of all, the 
major piece to any project really is the, the HTML. So in this project, we are kind of, we start out with a base level of structure. So we've got things like the, the boilerplate stuff, like the doc type, for instance, and the HTML element and the head and the body and a few other little bits and pieces as well. So we get started out with just the, the skeleton of our project. We also have the content kind of there for us. So the content is there ready to go. All we now need to do is add some HTML elements. So the HTML is kind of there ready and then we're gonna actually add the structure ourselves. We also have a style guide file. So this is a markdown file. Um, so you can actually open it and preview the file and see kind of what the actual style guide for this project is gonna be. And this is something that we provide in all of the free challenges in Frontend Mentor. We have this markdown file with all of this like colors and fonts and things like this. As you saw earlier, we have our premium challenges where you have a bit more of a professional like design system actually in the design file itself. Um, whereas the free challenges, we have this markdown file. So here we can see that the mobile design is at, it was done at 375 pixels width and the desktop design was done at 1440 as far as the, the width goes. So this is, this will kind of inform our decisions on like how we build it, what the screen size will be when we build it. But then also is just this, and this goes back to the kind of pixel perfect nature um, and not chasing that is that these are just a guide. So the mobile design is a guide for how it should look at 375 pixels. The desktop design is a guide for how it should look at 1440 pixels. And then we're gonna have to sort of figure things out in between. So smaller screens, middle screens, like tablets, this kind of stuff, and then even sort of larger screens as well. Then we've also got the different colors. We are using um, HSL as a color format in this. When we actually get into the CSS, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about why we use HSL and why I personally prefer HSL as my kind of preferred color format to use versus like hex or RGB. We've then got the typography. So kind of body copy font size is 15 pixels. And then we're gonna just size stuff based on that. Obviously we've got the design file so we can actually poke around um, and really see exactly what these font sizes are. And then the font that we're gonna be loading in is a Google font called Spartan. And these are the three weights. So 400, 500, 700, are the different weights that we're gonna need for this font. So that's the style guide. And the final thing that we haven't looked at yet is the images folder. So the images folder is all of these challenges, all of these projects come with the images pre-exported, um, pre-optimized, all of this kind of thing. We'll be able to see here this star SVG. If I just put this to view, the SVG, we can see that this is an SVG element of the star icon, which is gonna be shown in the reviews. And as a developer, you, it goes back to what I was saying earlier with um, kind of exports, like asset exports. It depends on the company. Sometimes the designer will have done the export and they'll have everything ready for you and pre-optimized and all this kind of thing. Sometimes you'll have to do it as a developer. Sometimes it's a bit of a collaborative thing where you might sit down first of all and kind of go through and make sure everything, like the designer knows exactly what formats you need and what you're looking for, but it will change from company to company. Um, in our challenges, we provide all of the assets kind of pre-exported, pre-optimized and ready to go. Okay, let's actually get this project opened up in the browser then. Um, with this HTML file, obviously we want to get this opened up in the browser. Um, we could just right click on the file and then say kind of reveal in Finder and just open up from the file system on our actual computers. 
However, we're gonna use a extension. You may already know this extension. It's a fairly common one. Uh, and it's going to essentially create a little server on our computer and just help us with our workflow so that when we open up the HTML file using this, uh, what's called live server package, it's gonna make it so that every single time that we save one of our files, it will just automatically refresh the browser and we will just see our changes straight away. So no extra step of like having to refresh the browser and all that kind of thing. It will just work and take on our latest updates. So to get that opened up in Visual Studio Code, we have this extensions tab over here on the left and we can just type in live server. Once you type that in, you'll see this package um, from someone called Ritwick Day, developer called Ritwick Day, come up and this is the one that we want. So for you, if you don't have it installed, it will say install here. So you can just click on that and then get it opened up. There's no, there's no extra kind of reload or like you don't need to shut down Visual Studio Code and then boot it back up again. Uh, all you need to do is just install it. Everything will be working from then at which point you'll be able to actually open up your HTML file. So once you've done that, you can close this tab, go back to the file structure and right click on the index HTML or two finger click if you're on a laptop with a trackpad like me, then the first option is gonna be open with live server. So if you just click that, you'll see that this will now open the project in the browser. And if I just zoom this in a bit, so we've got um, kind of the content is a bit bigger at the moment, especially just when we do our HTML, I'll zoom it in a little bit just so we can see the content a little bit clearer. And we can see here, we've got this big blob of content. And this is essentially the content that we've got inside of our index HTML file. And this is literally what every web page would really look like if HTML wasn't a thing. Obviously we need HTML in there to provide the structure and to provide the content for our page. And this obviously is not the nicest uh, looking at the moment. So we need to add this structure in and start to add in like H1, H2s, like paragraphs, all of this kind of thing. And then when we get to the CSS, we'll really start to be able to make it look good and make it start looking like the design. Okay, so now you should have everything opened up in your browser. Uh, we've got our content here. So this is already sort of predefined. And if we go back to the design file, you'll remember that when I was kind of planning through the design, I was saying that if this was a real world website, it would probably be just a section in a larger website. So we're going to add a main element around all of the content. And then we're also going to add a section element on the inside of that as well, because that would be a fairly typical structure that you might get if this was on say a homepage or something like that. And beyond just the main and the section elements, uh, we're gonna then add, as we mentioned earlier, kind of H1 paragraph, a list of reviews and a list of testimonials. So let's actually dive in and start writing out some HTML. So we've got this, what we're looking at at the moment, and now we're gonna have a look at the HTML and actually start building out some of the structure to our page. So I mentioned before that we were going to add a main element and a section element to wrap around the entire content. So let's start by doing that. So inside of the body, this is where all of the visible content is gonna go. So we can add a main element. I'm gonna be using um, Emmet, E-M-M-E-T as a tool within Visual Studio Code to easily and quickly kind of build out HTML elements. Some of you may have heard of Emmet before, some of you have, may not have. It's actually a package that comes pre-installed in Visual Studio Code. And it's actually available regardless of the text editor that you use, if you use like uh, Atom or Sublime Text or something like this, you can actually install it in those. In Visual Studio Code, it just comes pre-installed and it allows you to just write out the name of an element 
and then you can just hit the tab key to create the rest of it. It's great because it really reduces the chance that you're going to uh, kind of make little typos or anything like that, miss out the forward slash on the closing tag and this kind of thing. So it's a really nice tool. So we said before, we're gonna have a main element and then a section element, and then all of the content was gonna be inside the two of them. So we'll create the section element as well. When my computer catches up, it's running a little bit slowly for some reason. So we've got the main element, and then we've got nested inside of that, we've got a section element, and this is where we want all of our content to go. And we've got all of the content pre-written, so we could just cut and paste it, but what we're gonna do is use a little shortcut that kind of some of you may know, and some of you may not know. So this little shortcut allows you to, first of all, highlight all of the content that you want to move. So you could just do this by dragging your cursor over it and kind of highlighting everything. And then once you've got this content, so all of the content down to the closing body tag highlighted, you can then just press option. So hold down option. It might also be called alt on your laptop or your computer. Uh, different computers will have different names for them. On mine, it's called option. So if ever I say option, I mean option or alt. So I'm gonna hold down the option key and then press the up arrow. And you'll see what that does. If I move it over here a little bit, you can see that it is reordering the code. This workshop is part of the Zero to Mastery Academy. You can watch the full workshop and all previously held workshops by joining the Zero to Mastery Academy. Click the link in the video description below to check it out.